Nos da uh, people, this is take three of this. I don't know why it won't save, but uh, so yeah, this is um, silent film vlog again. I am going uh, to see Nostra 2 on Symphon de Grounds, uh, which I might have mangled the German, but Symphony of Horror is like the English translation, or at least the English title subtitle used on the you know film's main title. So yeah. Uh, I know I did the one last year. Uh, usually they rotate between Nosferatu and Phantom of the Opera every Halloween, as in, like, um, the oldest surviving film version of Phantom of the Opera. That's the one starring Lon Chaney. There is an older one, but it's lost. I don't remember how much of it survives. I, I'm sure it's mostly stills. Uh, but yeah, like, nothing that... So there's plenty of time before the film starts, and, okay, uh, uh, was this in my second take? I forget if I, what I said in the take that actually saved, but, um, so I guess I see why we're doing Nosferatu for two years in a row this time. Uh, we have, um... Uh, with live organ accompaniment and original score by head organist Andrew Rogers. So, um, yeah, our, uh, uh, the theater's um, primary organist is having himself a vanity project. I also picked up this, I don't, hmm, okay, November 2nd. Okay, I might be able to do this in part because uh, the Ken Russell film, Listomania, starring Roger Daltrey, wherein at one point in the film, Daltrey is writing a six-foot-long paper mache dingle. <laughs> so that's kind of forever um, painted the image of Franz Liszt for me. Uh, we've also got a, uh, I've also got a handbill for, I'm probably not going to be able to attend to this, we've got a uh, documentary about the um, the definitive story of the movie Palace, which Michigan Theater is one. Uh, so let's see what we have in the newsletter to say about uh, today's film. Okay, Nosferatu, 1922, with live organ accompaniment uh, and original score on the newly restored 1928 Barton Organ, uh, an Ann Arbor tradition continues with Nosferatu, the first vampire movie. I don't think so. I don't think that's correct, but it's what possibly the oldest surviving, um, if not one of the oldest surviving, but no, this is not the first vampire movie um, <laughs> that I know for a fact. Uh, a real estate agent uh, played by Gustav van von uh, Wangenheim uh, begins conducting business with the eerie Count Orlock, the beyond creepy Max Schreck. Uh, who goes on a rampage when he becomes obsessed with the man's beautiful wife. Roger Ebert said it best about this Michigan theater Halloween tradition. Uh, Nosferatu doesn't scare us, but it haunts us. It shows not that vampires can jump out of the shadows, but that evil can grow there, nourished on death. 93 minutes, fantasy slash horror not rated. Uh, because... Uh, uh, released a good decade before the Haze Code, so because I've got uh, about 20 minutes before I should find a good seat in the main theater room, I don't want to go upstairs to watch this, though. Actually, I think the acoustics might be better upstairs. I don't know. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm going to um, end this clip and go do a quick little tour of the theater. So we've got your uh, box office and concession stand out in the front, and I, I love this. This is probably my favorite part of the thing, but uh, you know what? Let's do it this way. And a uh, uh, water bottle in my shoulder bag. But let's see, going upstairs, and... Here we've got a list of local rich jackasses. Ah, uh, yeah. Don't tell me they're not. Sure, I may not know them personally, but if you got that kind of money, you're probably a jackass. And 
so the uh, this particular building, I want to say, uh, whoa. oh, I'm feeling dizzy all of a sudden. Uh, I want to say this particular building went up just before or just after the uh, turn of the 20th century. I know it's older than the 20s. That much I can say with an amount of confidence. So, uh, obviously it got wired for electricity um, fairly early on. We've got LEDs in here. I, I don't think these wall sconces are original to the building, but they are very nice and this style that they use is appropriate enough. So, uh, something on, um, what the hell? Oh, this is the, this is the lady. This is fancy. What the hell? And here's the men's room. Let's hope nobody is, oh my gosh, it's like night and day. Really? The ladies get floral arrangements in their potty, and you just get pink tiled walls. That's nice. Please use aisle five. Okay. Now let's do a quick little walk around through here. Seating. And oh, there's the organ. And whoosh. Oh, I wish I knew. Oh, even with my Sorry, eyesight. I can see some, uh, I can sort of see some ghosting of the, uh, that one was a bit stronger, but I can sort of see some ghosting of the painting that got destroyed with paint over it. It was a fresco at one time. It was a really beautiful one. This one I can't see so much. The one on the other side I can, but there's people over there, and... Dun, 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 dun. And of course my hair is going to fall out because this is my life today. And I came down the other side. I kind of borked this. Okay. Uh, hey. I could have gone up that way and then around and then back, but no. Got to floral arrangements in the ladies. Potty. Nothing but bare pink tiles in the gents. I see how they are. And, uh, dedicated community of service and compassion for all those in the field of honors. Judy, produ Robert, producer, and artist for sharing her energy and talent on behalf of the. Okay. And. No, no problem. Ah, uh, you're fine. Ah, uh, <laughs> uh, now we've got all sorts of our little local history plaques, because why not? One of these days I need to come in here and read all of this for people, because this is my life. Ooh. 
antique trash receptacle. What? This, this is one of my favorite unsung features of the theater. Is this old vellum shade lamp. This is so old. I would guess. I would pr pr probably place it a good 10-15 years older than my lamp at home. Uh, but this is just beautiful. And I don't remember this here last year. But okay. So, I will four. Dun, 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 dun. This is so beautiful. You don't see these things anymore. Or if you do, they cut corners on the on the materials. And here we are. This is, this is why I really come here every year and why I don't do, mind doing this two years in a row with Nosferatu. Ha ha ha. I'm gonna ramble on about this later. Maybe from the alley. Either way from my bus stop home.
it, uh, it is indeed, well, uh, close enough, I don't know, it's like one in the afternoon, oh gosh, no, going on two in the afternoon, and it is the next day, uh, so, let's see, highlights of, um, last night's, uh, what's that called, the, uh, the film, the silent film, because this is silent film vlogging, and, uh, so, yeah, I really enjoyed the, uh, score that our current Michigan theater organist, uh, Andrew Rogers was doing, and he, uh, he, he led this Q&A after the film, and, of course, like, I had very few questions about the film or the history of silent films because I have been a fan of silent films since I was at least 10 years old. That's when I remember first seeing, like, my first, like, real, um, silent film on, I think it was on PBS. It was either on PBS or, I forget if, uh, Turner, um, classic movies had started up at that point yet. So it was either on PBS or it was on a cable station, and if it was on cable, it was, um, I, I can't remember if TCM started up already then, because that would have been like 1990, 91, um, maybe it was, um, A&E before it became, you know, before, uh, it devolved into all sorts of, like, reality docu-series sorts of shows. But yeah, Turner Classic Movies. That started up because on TBS, uh, Ted Turner was airing a few films, um, with color tinting when they'd originally been filmed in black and white, and I, I know there'd been something about editing that, um, 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 uh, Philip's vision on the, uh, the animated sitcom The Critic. I love that show. I really do. Unfortunately, if you look at the current state of the uh, of the film industry, it's become sort of prophetic. Like this was supposed to be goofing on um, the film industry, and yet it became. It's like Hollywood took this as a personal challenge. All of these bad, bad movie remakes. But yeah, um, the character Duke Phillips on The Critic, that's why I brought this up. He was a thinly veiled parody of Ted Turner, and I love Ted Turner in the same way that I love Harlan Sanders of KFC. It's because they're, they're both kind of nuts. They're both kind of nuts, and very entertainingly so, and they have more dollars than sense, and kind of, like, get away with so much. Of course, Harlan Sanders has now passed. Ted Turner is somehow still going along, which kind of makes me think that maybe he's a little bit evil, because uh, only the good die young. Of course, then again, Harlan Sanders was, like, 90 when he died. But I digress. So, I've been a fan of silent films since I was about 10 years old, so I'm... shit. I'm almost 40, so that's almost 30 years I've been watching silent movies. I have learned a lot about them over that, you know, 30 years. So I had, like, no questions about Nosferatu. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I had no uh, questions about Nosferatu or F.W. Murnau or silent films in general, broadly speaking. Cat, if you knock the phone over, I will be very upset. Oh, he sees the feathers that I was wearing last night. Please, please go away. You're in the way. Why are you always in the way? Is it because you're kitty? Is it because kitty always does nice, cute things? Yes, yes it is. Uh, so yeah, I had, I had no questions about, uh, Nosferatu. I have seen, um, I've seen this movie... Ah, uh, let's see, I have it on DVD. I have one edition on DVD. I keep meaning to get the version that has the music by Typo Negative as the soundtrack, but I don't know. Other things just keep putting that one on the back burner. But yeah, I've got a really great um, Kino edition that's like really nice and all highly restored. It's got two discs, even though it's like an 80 minute movie. <laughs> So it's got all of these special features and everything. I had no questions about F.W. Murnau. 
I'm a huge fan of F.W. Murnau, and I should link in the description box a video I did um, recalling the death of F.W. Murnau. That was done a little over a year ago. That was, like, my obligatory coming out day video. Um, I didn't use that video to come out, but I used it as kind of, you know, an, a, st a history lesson about... Um, Gothen LGBT history, and yes, his death is related to him being gay, but that's another story for another time. That was another story at another time. Who the hell am I talking about? So, and I had no real questions broadly about silent films. I did have a question about um, why they didn't go and rotate with Phantom of the Opera, because I still have the ticket stub from two years ago, so, not last year, but the year before, um, about, you know, I, I have the tickets up from two years ago, from Phantom of the Opera, starring Lon Chaney, and I asked, why didn't they wrote, because it was Nosferatu last year, and yet it was Nosferatu again this year, so... why didn't they rotate? That is what I asked, and he just, I don't know... Rogers just used that opportunity to go plug that he was going to be playing organ for Phantom at another theater this Friday. Um, I forget which theater, but it's one I can't get to, and it's one I can't afford to. Um, yeah, uh, I'm, I lost count of these, so I'm just going to unravel that and hold on to it there. So, uh, so yeah, he didn't answer my question. He took that as an opportune moment to plug and say, oh, well, you know, we usually do Nostra, and I'm like saying, like, no, literally no, like, literally two years ago, and I have the ticket stub at home, and I would have thought to bring it to me if I knew you were going to dodge the question like this. Well, okay, I didn't put it in that many words, but that was surely the expression on my face as he's not answering the question. Um, about a good pff, five minutes later or so, I just, I don't know, I kind of got bored. I noticed he wasn't exactly answering a couple other people's questions as thoroughly as I would have. He um, definitely was not answering them as well as I would have, which you'd think, like, dude, you're getting paid for this. Me, I'm a loudmouth with internet access who y y y just collects a bunch of you know, old movies, some of them in, like, the, like the really, really awful, um, you know, $5 DVD editions, because, hey, it's public domain, and, hey, like, they pull in some, like, tinkle, tinkle, tea, ragtime music from, like, 19, you know, like, an old recording from, like, 1920 or something to, uh, you know, or something otherwise public domain that they, you know, pay a session musician, like, the bare minimum to record a few t thing, a few bars, you know, and splice it over as a soundtrack. It's like, you know, so yeah, I've got some, I, I've got a whole lot of some of my favorite silent films, some of them in the worst DVD editions possible, but they're one of my favorite films, so, you know, um, you know, so I, I have to have a, a copy to satiate my um, annual or twice annual, um, desire to watch it. One of which is the Lon Chaney fan with the opera. That's in a really, really bad edition. Like, oh gosh, this, it's like, wow, that, like, no effort was made into the, like, it has the most shoddy chapter breaks. It really does. It's like, like, I probably would have gotten better chapter breaks if I'd had this on VHS and, you know, just like, paused it to go to the bathroom, like, when I really, you know, like, when I'm in a bladder emergency. I paused it to go to the bathroom. That would have been a better chapter break than this copy of Phantom of the Opera with Lon Chaney. And the reason that I was willing to settle for a really crap edition of this one is, okay, first off, the special edition, at the time I really wanted to buy it, was very much out of my price range. Second reason, um... It's kind of sentimental. I mean, in addition to the fact that Lon Chaney is, was an amazing actor. I didn't even call his son, who, you know, went into acting afterward. I didn't even call him, like, you know, Crichton chose Lon Jr. as his stage and screen name. I call him Crichton. That is his name. 
That was the name his father gave him, and he wasn't even half the actor his father was. Fight me on this. But yeah, I, uh... Um, so yeah, like, uh, Lon Chaney, um, Phantom. Uh, there's kind of a sentimental sentimentality for that, um, which is that, um, that was, like, one of the, uh, first, um, yeah, that was the, uh, that, <laughs> that was the first date for my best ex and I was, um, when Stephen Ball was still the, uh, the head organ player at the Michigan Theater, and, um, and then what happened, um, so yeah, Stephen Ball was still the organ player, and he, um, he did this sort of annual, um, no, not annual, it was like twice a month, he organized, like, silent movie Sundays, and it was like at 10 a.m., but, um, no, this was a Halloween. This was a Halloween showing of Phantom, because, yeah, because it was at night, and the silent movie Sundays were always at, like, 10 a.m., and I, um, uh, thankfully, when that was still going, I was, um, yeah, I was going to Pioneer High for, like, maybe, like, yeah, yeah, the semester that I did at Pioneer High, and then I was, like, still kind of working, um, normal people hours. I was still on a diurnal-ish schedule back then, so I was able to make it. I wasn't that happy about it, because I'm generally a more awake person after two in the afternoon, even, you know, getting up at noon. But, um, but yeah, then what was I saying? So yeah, I, uh, yeah, I used to go to the silent movie Sundays, um, hosted by Stephen Ball at the Michigan Theater, um, back, way back when. But yeah, that was a Halloween showing, a Phantom of the Opera, and I don't think I still have the ticket stub for that, but I, um, I still have, um, pictures from that night, and I remember that night very clearly, because then we, uh, um, so yeah, Scott and I met up, and a couple of his friends came with him. It was kind of like a double date sort of thing. I didn't think that was officially a date at that point between my best ex and I, um, but um, it kind of worked out that way. Uh, but yeah, and, I, and we went down to the Fleetwood Diner afterward because it was 24 hours, and it was like, uh, 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 yeah, it was like 10, 11 at night at that point, and it was 24 hours. It was within a fair walking distance, and I said that, um, uh, his friend Eddie's girlfriend should read the bathroom at the Fleetwood, and that was, and she's like, okay, I gotta go read the bathroom. So, yeah, it, it's sentimental. That's, that's why I'm okay with a really crap edition of Phantom of the Opera, and now whenever I see the, uh, the really nice Kino edition of Lon Chaney's Phantom of the Opera, it's, um, I think it went out of print for a while. Occasionally they do that, and, you know, like, they'll, like, create this false scarcity, much like Disney does with things. Uh, last I looked, anyway, their really nice Fancy Pants edition was, um, was being sold, like, third party because temporarily out of print or whatever. I don't know. I'll go look again. But, yeah, like I was saying, um, so, yeah, like, the guy, like, like, yeah, you can say that, like, Nosferatu is part of the Halloween tradition at the Michigan Theater, but it's not the only one. Like, I, I literally have evidence of having seen this before, a, you know, in October at the Michigan. Like, the man, I don't know, like, like I said. Like, so, yeah, as far as, I, I'd said some stuff in some of my earlier clips about this, because, um, ah, uh, gosh, the first big take I did for, uh, this um, video of the silent film vlogging was, uh, yeah, that somehow did not save to camera, I don't, or save to phone, whatever. It didn't save to my memory thing on the thing. Um, but yeah, I was going on in some poorly lit conditions. I'm hoping that's why it didn't save. So I went going on about this, about how, um, uh, one of the reasons that I love going with the live organ accompaniment to the silent films, even though, like I said, I have Nosferatu on DVD. I've seen this movie. I would not be surprised if it was literally a combined 100 times in total um, through, like, uh, DVD or cable television and, like, with live organ accompaniment at, you know, various theaters. Usually this one. Usually the Michigan 
uh, in Ann Arbor. Um. Not going to lie, because that's usually where I'm living when they play it. One of the reasons that I really enjoy going to see it um, with live accompaniment even though, like I said, I've seen it probably literally a hundred times, it would not surprise me, um, is I have synesthesia. Uh, the, uh, the term roughly translates, you know, the, uh, the compound, it's a compound word, um, um, I believe Greek roots. Sometimes I get, con sometimes I, mis I mistake Latin roots for Greek roots and vice versa. Please don't, like, I don't know, but I believe it's Greek roots. It sounds like Greek roots to me. Um, loosely translates to um, crossed senses, and so that is when a per now there's like broadly like they 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 broadly have like two categories of synesthesia. Um, once it, one is um, projective synesthesia, where um, there's a documentary called Derek Tastes Like Earwax, where, um, and the, um, the man who's, like, the main, um, focal point of the documentary, whenever he hears the name Derek, he has, like, he suddenly has this flash of the taste of earwax in his mouth. Uh, <laughs> so, like, his brain registers this as something that, you know, is literally triggering one of the other, triggering one of the other senses. Okay, fair. And um, the other kind is like associative synesthesia. One of the more common ways we see this, uh, though not, I don't know if it's necessary, I don't know if uh, how much of uh, said uh, people who have this type of synesthesia uh, will literally see like color, or numbers and letters in colors, like, like say the number one is pink, or there's something inherently pink about it. Like some, uh, if they were associative synesthetes, um, they would just associate the number one as being inherently pink. Whereas if they were projective synesthetes, every time they saw the number one, it would be in pink. Um, or maybe they'd see like a flash of pink, like within the corners of their peripheral vision. And here's about where mine is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have like, no practical amount of peripheral vision. Uh, one of the reasons I'm too blind to drive, but that's another story for another time. So, um, aerophones. So, um, organs, including my harmonium, um, certain types of accordions, um, yeah, yeah, most organs. Electric organs, not so much, um, unless it's really good at mimicking the sounds of aerophone organs. Um, organs especially, I have a, I have oral tactile synesthesia, or, um, Wikipedia calls it, um, um, auditory tactile. Um, I don't know, I like the, f the sound of oral tactile, it just, I don't know, the alliteration sounds better to me. So I've got oral tactile synesthesia. There are certain musical sounds, a big one being like aerophones, so organs, certain kind of, kinds of accordions, um, certain electric organs or um, synthesizers that are near perfect at mimicking organ sounds. Um, I think feel that all through here. Like, it's not the, really the ASMR, which a lot of people associate with, like, like, with head tingles sort of thing, but, like, I will feel it all through here. It feels most strongly around here, like, around my clavicle. Um, there are other sounds uh, that I will feel in other parts of my body. Um, a lot of, um, <laughs> Uh, percussive strings, so, um, harps, mostly harps, mostly harps, I will feel it in my arms, um, not so much guitars, I think a lot of that has to do with the way, like, guitars are also percussive string instruments, but they're designed so differently that the sound is quite different, so, um, it, it's certain kinds of guitar sounds, like uh, like steel guitars. Steel guitars, I will feel it in my arms. Um, again, not so much guitars, not really electric guitars, though 
um, that that jangly kind of pedal sound with um, that's in psychedelic music and that um, became imported to gothic rock music. So psychedelic rock, gothic rock, um, certain kinds of prog. I kind of feel that um, oh, Echo and the Bunny Men. If you know what what you probably know what kind of guitar sound I'm thinking of. Um, yeah, more like the Echo and the Bunny Men kind of. Um, I know they used it a lot. That's one of the reasons I just love Echo and the Bunny Men. I kind of feel it along my spine. Again, not so much like uh, not so much like um, like uh, like Sisters of Mercy, but like Echo and the Bunny Men. Um, certain fields of the Nephilim songs. Um, so yeah, I. But yeah, like I said, like organs, aerophones, those are those are really, <laughs> really. Um, good at triggering my synesthesia feelings. Uh, I, I literally thought this was something like, uh, when I was about like 10, 11 years old, there was that Gloria Estevan song, um, had lines like, uh, feel the music play, help you get away, something like that. So I literally thought this was something everybody felt like when certain kinds of music played. I thought this was a common thing, but according to Wikipedia, it's one of the less common forms of uh, synesthesia, especially, like, projective, whereas, um, but, uh, but, yeah, I, uh, I guess a lot of people just assume this is poetic license, you know, like, like, maybe, like, a ten-year-old wouldn't put it in that many words, but, um, would sort of understand that it's not necessarily meant to be literal. A five-year-old might think it's meant to be literal, and then, like, maybe assume, oh, it has to do with, like, you know, when the volume of uh, the music is at a certain decibel level, like, you feel the vibrations, and that's how you, you know, and that's why you dance or something. But, yeah, like, a ten-year-old is probably not going to assume this is meant to be literal, whereas I just, I don't know, I thought, because I always literally felt music playing, at least certain kinds of music, that everybody did, because I'm ten, and, you know, I just didn't really think anything of it until, um, a couple friends of mine, um, Start talking about their own synesthesia on separate occasions. Um, my uh, my old friend Darcy, she um, like certain tastes. She'll get that flash of a, uh, um, you know, she'll get a flash of color in the corner of her peripheral vision. Like um, uh, I forget exactly what kind of cookie. So I'm just going to say Oreos because they have a very particular taste and texture to them. But yeah, like, you know, like Oreos would like suddenly she'd get this flash of purple around her peripheral vision. And, you know, so like there are certain tastes that, you know, just became like projective in color to her. And, um, oh, I forget, um, what kind one of my, one of the Jasons has. I have like, that was such a common name for so long, you know? Uh, but yeah, one of the Jasons I know, I forget exactly um, how his synesthesia works, but yeah, I, like I said, I was, I was in my twenties before I realized this was not a literal thing, but yeah, that's one of the reasons that I love going to silent films at the, um, with live organ accompaniment, because it's just, it's just such a good feeling for me. I really enjoy this, um, and the fact that I can feel, um, the movie as it's happening, which is probably a way that, I don't know. You probably heard in some of the clips that I left in from the, you know, my, my little, uh, contraband clips that, um, a modern audience doesn't really watch, uh, silent film the way it was intended to be. So, the acting in silent films, I think I've gone on about this in other videos, so I'm just gonna keep it as short as possible, but the acting in silent films is, uh, it's based on pantomime. It's based on pantomime and other kinds of stage acting, but, you know, mime is specifically a kind of acting that, especially like the European silence, um, you know, drew heavily from to develop acting for silent films. You know, so there is this kind of exaggeration to it because you're accounting for the lack of sound to, you know, help convey emotion and mood and feelings. So, um, you know, and um, the music was a part of that, which is why, like, uh, and I've gone on about this at length too, like, you know, like the same movie could be shown um, two completely different ways because while a lot of the bigger studios would send along a recommended score, 
it's not like the, you know, movie house at the time, you know, in like 1927. I was completely off about when the Michigan was built. It was built in 27. So, you know, like the Michigan Theater would get, you know, uh, well, back when it was originally built. I forget what its original name was. Um, but yeah, like back when it was, um, you know, built in 1927, you know, they'd get like, say, uh, this is a little bit old for that time, but you know, they, they get, um, what's a good one from about that year? Uh, I don't know. All of my ones on the shelf are a little bit older. Uh, let's say Metropolis. Like they'd get Fritz Lang's Metropolis in 1927, like six years after the fact for some reason. It's German. Let's go with that. So, and they get a recommended score for Metropolis. Now, if they had a competent enough organist who, you know, or even like, you know, like they even have the pit orchestra, like the, uh, the orchestra pit is still intact. Yeah. They have, they, you know, like, um, have the things that go over it, um, when not in use for the full orchestra, but yeah, they've also got an orchestra pit. It was built to be a movie palace. So like, um, so yeah, if they decided like for a matinee, like they could just have, you know, like the organ player, um, doing, um, a generally improvised, um, uh, score for Metropolis, but they'd have like the full recommended score with full orchestra later in the day. And it would be like seeing two completely different films depending on, you know, um, what the organ player would do during the matinee screening. So where was I going? Um, I was going somewhere with all of this. Metropolis, um... Hmm. I had a thought. <laughs> I had a thought, and it wandered away from me. <laughs> oh, this is wonderful, right? Okay, um, but yeah, that's, that's one of the things that I just... It is one of the things that I love, is that, like, I, um... Like, I, I can... Oh, right. Right, so, uh, so yeah, pantomime acting. So, like, the music and, you know, the like, the music score... And the, um, you know, would do one part of making up for the lack of sound, um, recorded to the film itself. Um, but, you know, the actors on the stage also had to make up for the lack of sound, you know, that, you know, because the, uh, the cameras at the time weren't able to pick up sound. Okay, fair. Uh, so, yeah, like, it can be kind of exaggerated, and it... Um, and it seems funny to a modern audience to see, like, these highly exaggerated facial expressions, but a lot of people forget that, or they're just not aware that this was a time when, um, when films had to be made very differently. They, yeah, they were, like, um, you know, it was, it was very much, um, adapting to the media, like, like on a play on a stage play, depending on the size of the audience, you might not have needed to exaggerate your facial expressions or your, you know, body gestures that much. Um, though, you know, a lot of times in opera, they would, you know, just, you know, because like, you know, a big, you know, even, even a small opera house really, <laughs> you know, you're going to have, like, these, these big, like, domed ceilings with, like, several tiers of seating, you know, each with their own capacity in really, like, getting like, a good view of what's going on on the stage, and, like, you know, the, uh, the music is only doing so much, you have to, you know, like, have these grand gestures with the pantomime acting, and so, like I said, like, that can be, that can seem kind of funny to a modern audience, but, it really takes you out of the moment, and so, I don't know, it kind of, it kind of cheeses me off, because, um, but at the same time, um, it, uh, I, th I, I think to some extent, my, um, uh, this is probably, you know, related to my ADHD that, like, because I'm already getting the, uh, the, the crossed senses with my aural tactile synesthesia and I'm feeling the music like all around like my clavicle and shoulders and all of that. Um, it's a little bit easier for me to um, be less jarred by the people around me who don't understand how to watch silent film. 
Um, in fact, I kind of noticed that this year, that I was easier, it was a much easier for me to be taken into the film. Um, like, so yeah, like, I did hear, like, people around me, like, you know, laughing in inappropriate scenes because they don't understand the kind of acting that was used in the films. Um, but because I'm having more than one of my... Well, more than two, because it's also a visual medium. Um, so yeah, because I'm having more than just, like, my, my sound and... My sound and my vision <laughs> stimulated, and I'm also having, um, you know, my, uh, my, my tactile senses stimulated. Uh, it was a little bit easier for me to, like, stay in the moment. I loved last year's ex experimental music that was being made, uh, along with the, the film. But this year, it was easier for me to stay in the moment of the film, and I, I don't know, I attribute some of that to um, my oral tactile synesthesia. So, yeah, in case you're curious, like, why I went to go see this same film again this year, even though they usually rotate it, contrary to what Andrew Rogers claims, because, I'm like, hun, I have the ticket stubs from two years ago... <laughs> Like, seriously. Like, oh my god, honey, honey, honey. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's just a different thing every time, and I love it. Yeah. Ah. Oh. And, uh, so, yeah, that's, that's one of the reasons that I go e even, like, two years in a row, because I, I don't know, I just, I just love the organ music. I love the way that it feels. I don't just love the way that it sounds, I also love the way that it feels. So... Yeah, alright, I've been going on far too much, I have some daily, I have last night's daily show to watch, so, bats and kisses, uh, take care of yourselves, wear your sunscreen, as always, hit the, hit the thumbs down below to denote your like or dislike, please don't chew on that, that's mine, um, cat over here, um, uh, thumbs, hit subscribe, and bell notifications if you have not yet already, uh, and you wish to see more of this complete nonsense, and if you want to, you know, further support this complete nonsense and have more dollars than cents, I have PayPal tip jar and Patreon in the description box below. Bats and kisses, and I love y'all. Take care, and goodbye!